Welcome to Module 3 of the International Criminal Law course. Today's topic will be General Principles of Jurisdiction, and this lecture will be a continuation of the jurisdictional materials we began in Module 2. Again, a reminder for the students in my course, please remember to do the reading and also to download the PowerPoint slides prior to watching today's lecture. As we begin Module 3, we return one more time to some overarching principles of international criminal law before delving into specific crimes in our next module. For this final introductory session, we will take a closer look at jurisdiction and how jurisdiction can be established in particular cases. Our materials begin with an examination of the Restatement Third of the Foreign Relations Law of the United States. In particular, we're going to take a look at Section 402 regarding bases of jurisdiction to prescribe. As you review the restatement, you see that there are various methods of establishing jurisdiction over a defendant in the international criminal law field. While only one jurisdictional basis will be necessary, we will find that in many of the cases we examine, multiple potential uh, bases for jurisdiction will exist. Here in our first PowerPoint slide, you will see listed the five traditional forms of jurisdiction, those being territoriality, nationality, uh, the idea of protective jurisdiction, what we call passive nationality, and finally, universal jurisdiction, a concept that we have explored a little bit in some of our earlier sessions. The first jurisdictional basis is where all or some substantial part of the conduct takes place within the country's territory. We call this territoriality, and it is one of the most traditional forms of jurisdiction in the international realm. In the restatement, we see several ways of applying the territoriality principle. First, a country has jurisdiction where the conduct takes place within its territory. Second, a country has jurisdiction based on the status of persons present within its territory. And third, a country has jurisdiction where conduct outside its territory has or is intended to have substantial effect within its territory. This final one, certainly the broadest, and one that we'll see play out, play out in one of our cases today. The second jurisdictional basis in their statement is called nationality. Here, a country may prescribe law with respect to the activities, interests, status, or relations of a country's national outside as well as within its territory. Thus, the United States can prescribe laws regarding the actions of U.S. citizens even if that conduct occurs outside the United States. The third jurisdictional basis is in the restatement is called protective jurisdiction. This form of jurisdiction applies to certain conduct outside the country's territory by persons not its nationals that is directed against the security of the state or against a limited class of other state interests. Thus, if a terrorist group was plotting an attack in Europe with the goal that it would destabilize U.S. relations with its NATO allies, the U.S. would arguably have jurisdiction over this conduct even though it occurred outside the United States and involved no U.S. citizens because it was directed against the security of the United States and against uh, other important state interests such as our treaty obligations and our reliance on our allies through NATO. The fourth jurisdictional basis is less accepted and therefore appears in the comments section of the restatement, yet it is an important form of jurisdiction and one that we certainly see utilized in U.S. statutes to establish jurisdiction to prosecute in U.S. courts even when the conduct uh, occurs overseas. In particular, this form of jurisdiction is called passive nationality. Here, a country may have jurisdiction based on the nationality of the victim. This is usually thought to be an acceptable jurisdictional basis when the crime is directed at the victim in part because of the victim's nationality. As an example, therefore, a terrorist attack targeting U.S. citizens in a foreign country by foreign terrorists might still fall within the jurisdiction of the United States to prosecute 
because the victims were targeted because of their nationality. The fifth jurisdictional basis is universal jurisdiction. As we have discussed previously, this is a very old form of jurisdiction that is reserved for only specific types of crimes recognized by the community of nations as of universal concern. These would include things such as piracy, the slave trade, attacks on or hijackings of aircraft, genocide, war crimes, and certain acts of terrorism. Where universal jurisdiction applies, physical custody of the perpetrator is all that is required for a country to have jurisdiction to prosecute. The perpetrator's nationality, the nationality of the victim, where the offense occurred, are all irrelevant. In the materials that follow our introduction to the restatement, we find further details about each of these forms of jurisdiction and some accompanying case law that helps give us a better picture of how important these types of jurisdictions are and how they might apply in a particular case. The first case from our materials is the case of Chu Han Mo v. United States from the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, and it addresses the territorial principle. In Chu, the defendant was a Malaysian citizen charged with conspiracy to import heroin into the United States and two counts of distribution of heroin. He pled guilty to the conspiracy counts and one of the substantive counts. The case then came up for appeal after the court dismissed his habeas corpus action in which he argued the United States lacked jurisdiction in that the unlawful acts occurred in Malaysia and not in the United States. Note that in beginning its discussion of the jurisdictional issue, the court here refers to United States v. Bowman, a case from our last module, for the general proposition that, quote, courts have been reluctant to give extraterritorial effect to penal statutes, end quote, but have, quote, done so when congressional intent to give extraterritorial effect is clear, end quote. For the substantive count here, the court notes that the statute specifically states that it is intended to apply extraterritorially. Thus, it would be appropriate to apply this particular statute in this case. For the conspiracy counts, the court notes that the statute does not specifically state whether it is to be applied extraterritorially. However, the court does note that courts have typically applied conspiracy statutes extraterritorially where the underlying substantive statutes have that effect, such as is the case here. Before moving further, the court asks the second important question from our last module. Even where the statute is intended to have extraterritorial effect, we must ask whether international law permits the, the exercise of jurisdiction by the United States. In answering this question, we must look to the five traditional forms of jurisdiction recognized under international law to see whether jurisdiction is justified and permitted here. Remember those five traditional forms of jurisdiction that we look to in our introduction today are territorial jurisdiction, nationality jurisdiction, protective jurisdiction, passive nationality jurisdiction, and universal jurisdiction. Based on what you know about this case, what forms of jurisdiction do you think might apply here? Take a moment to write down some thoughts before continuing with the video. In the Chu case, the court focuses on two types of jurisdiction that might indicate that international law would permit the exercise of jurisdiction by the United States regarding the substantive charge of distribution of heroin. Remember, there are two charges for which the defendant has pled guilty, one a substantive charge of distribution and the other a conspiracy charge. So again, with regards to that substantive distribution charge, first, the court argues that while the heroin was distributed in Japan, it was intended to eventually be distributed 
in the United States. This would allow for territorial jurisdiction. If we look back to the restatement language, recall, recall that jurisdiction is permitted under international law, quote, where conduct outside its territory has or is intended to have substantial effect within its territory. The court calls this the objective territorial principle. Second, the court argues that the protective principle might justify jurisdiction in this case as well. Here, the court argues that the unlawful importation of controlled substances compromises a country's control of its own borders. Under the restatement, recall that jurisdiction is permitted under international law regarding certain conduct outside the country's territory by persons not its national that is directed against the security of the state or against a limited class of other state interests. Here, the court is arguing that controlling the borders and what comes across the borders is one such state interest. The court then notes that these jurisdictional hooks would be equally applicable to the conspiracy count in the case. The court offers a further jurisdictional hook applicable to the conspiracy counts as well. The court notes, quote, the Supreme Court has held that extraterritorial jurisdiction over aliens exists when a conspiracy had for its object crime in the United States and overt acts were committed in the United States by co-conspirators. Here, the court notes, Chu had co-conspirators committing acts in furtherance of the conspiracy in the United States. So once again, a number of potential jurisdictional hooks in this case, applying international law. And again, a nice example of our first type of jurisdiction, that being territoriality, along with an introduction to some of our other concepts. One of the lingering questions from the Chu case is whether territoriality requires an act within the jurisdictional territory of the United States. In Chu, the court found that the territoriality principle applied to the substantive heroin distribution charge because there was the intent to produce a detrimental effect within the United States once the heroin was delivered. In the conspiracy count, however, the court in Chu points out the Supreme Court has required an overt act committed in the United States, which was easily established in this particular case. But what if there was not such an act here? The general conspiracy statute in federal law, 18 U.S.C. section 371, requires an overt act as an element of the offense. But it's important to note here that many U.S. narcotics conspiracy statutes do not require an overt act. In United States v. Ricardo, a Fifth Circuit case from 1980, the appeals court examined whether a conviction could be sustained where the government could only show that the defendants intended to carry out an overt act within the territorial jurisdiction of the United States, but did not get the chance to do so because they were intercepted in the Gulf of Mexico before they entered U.S. territorial water. Because they were charged with conspiracy statutes that did not require an overt act, some of those narcotics conspiracy statutes I just mentioned, the court determined that where, quote, the statute itself does not require proof of an overt act, jurisdiction attaches upon a mere showing of intended territorial effects, end quote. Conspiracy laws are already extremely broad, applying very early in a criminal scheme. As we continue moving through our material, consider whether you think the Ricardo case makes these types of conspiracy statutes too broad, or whether this is an appropriate interpretation given the intent of Congress in providing law enforcement powerful tools to fight narcotics trafficking. The second section of the materials focuses on the nationality principle. Here we are introduced to the topic through the case of United States v. Walzak. In Walzak, the defendant, a U.S. citizen, was convicted of making false statements 
on a customs form while about to board a nonstop flight from Canada to the United States. In particular, he answered no to the statement, quote, I am carrying currency or monetary instruments over $5,000 U.S., end quote. When U.S. Customs officials stationed at the Canadian airport searched Walzak, they found he was actually carrying $52,000 in U.S. currency. As an aside, it is worth note that it is not uncommon for foreign nationals to grant permission for U.S. Customs agents to be stationed on their soil and perform their functions in this host nation. This explains why the search in Canada was performed by U.S. Customs agents. As a review, note that if Canada had not granted the U.S. Customs authorities permission to be stationed at the Canadian airport, their presence would have been in breach of the core principle from the Lotus case we examined in Module 1 of this course. Walzak was arrested and held in custody by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Once released, he voluntarily re-entered the United States and surrendered to authorities in Blaine, Washington. By voluntarily returning to the United States, Walzak saved the United States the difficulty of seeking his formal extradition. Extradition is a topic we will return to in much greater detail in a later module during this course. A grand jury in the United States then indicted Walzak under 18 U.S.C. Section 1001 and 18 U.S.C. Section 3238. 18 U.S.C. 1001, called the False Statements Statute, is a common charge used by the government because of its breadth of application. It states, quote, whoever in any matter within the jurisdiction of any department or agency of the United States knowingly and willfully makes any false, fictitious, or fraudulent statements or representations shall be fined not more than $10,000 or imprisoned not more than five years or both. 18 U.S.C. 3238 is also an important statute to be familiar with in the area of international criminal law. The statute states, quote, the trial of all offenses begun or committed upon the high seas or elsewhere out of the jurisdiction of any particular state or district shall be in the district in which the offender or any one of two or more joint offenders is arrested or is first brought. But if such offender or offenders are not so arrested or brought into any district, an indictment or information may be filed in the district of the last known residence of the offender or of any one of two or more joint offenders, or if no such residence is known, the indictment or information may be filed in the District of Columbia." End quote. As we move through our material this semester, you may refer back to this material as you consider why a particular case involving conduct overseas may have ended up in one or another jurisdiction. On appeal to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, Walzak argues that the United States does not have jurisdiction to prosecute his actions in Canada under 18 U.S.C. 1001 for false statements. The court dismisses this argument rather quickly, noting that pre-clearing passengers to depart the U.S. and having them complete the applicable customs form is directly within the jurisdiction of the U.S. Customs Service of the Department of the Treasury. As, there, as this is a, quote, Department of the United States, as required by the statute, the court says that Section 1001 for false statements apply, regardless of where the offense occurred. The court supplements this analysis of Section 1001 with reference to U.S. v. Bowman, a case we keep coming back to time and again. Here, the court notes that Bowman makes clear that some offenses are such that to limit their locus to the strictly territorial jurisdiction would be greatly to curtail the scope and usefulness of the statute. In such cases, Congress has not thought it necessary to make specific provisions in the law that the locus shall include the high seas and foreign countries, but allows it to be inferred from the nature of the offense. 
Finally, the court turns to the nationality principle to further justify jurisdiction in this case. Citing an earlier case, the court notes, quote, American authority over United States citizens could be based upon the allegiance they owe this country and its laws if the statute concerned evinces a legislative intent to control actions within and without the United States. Here, the court concludes that Section 1001 for false statements is just such a statute. Nationality is a strong jurisdictional concept because it holds the possibility of controlling the behavior of U.S. citizens throughout the world. As we move through our materials, consider what situations you believe might warrant the application of such an expansive principle of jurisdiction. The third section of the materials focuses on the protective principle. The case here, United States v. Gonzalez from the 11th Circuit, raises many interesting issues about the application of jurisdiction in the area of narcotics offenses. The case began when the U.S. Coast Guard intercepted a Honduran vessel with six foreign nationals on board, approximately 125 miles east of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. The Coast Guard found 125 bales of marijuana and contacted the Honduran government. When the Honduran government issued a statement of no objection to the boarding, search, seizure, and prosecution of the crew members, the six were arrested and transported to Miami. The defendants were there charged under the Marijuana on the High Seas Act of 1980, 21 U.S.C. Section 955A through 955D. One provision of the law states, quote, It is unlawful for any person on board any vessel within the customs waters of the United States to knowingly or intentionally manufacture or distribute or to possess with intent to manufacture or distribute a controlled substance. It's important to note that this language does not require the prosecution to establish an intent to distribute in the United States. The main challenge in such a prosecution, therefore, is establishing that the vessel was in the, quote, customs waters of the United States. The term customs waters is defined in 19 U.S.C. 1401J. There, it says, quote, the term customs waters means, in the case of a foreign vessel subject to a treaty or other arrangement between a foreign government and the United States enabling or permitting the authorities of the United States to board, examine, search, seize, or otherwise to enforce upon such vessel, upon the high seas, the laws of the United States, the waters within such distance of the coast of the United States, as the said authorities are or may be so enabled or permitted by such treaty or arrangement, and in the case of every other vessel, the waters within four leagues of the coast of the United States. A league is three nautical miles. Here, as the vessel was 125 miles off the coast, the court had to examine whether a treaty or other, quote, arrangement had expanded the jurisdiction of the United States to the waters surrounding this particular Honduran vessel. The court, in considering this question, determined that no formal agreement was contemplated by Congress. Rather, in passing this statute, Congress contemplated the, quote, precise type of consent shown in the present case, end quote. Therefore, the consent offered by Honduras after being contacted by the Coast Guard, after they had already stopped, searched, and seized the materials, was sufficient to satisfy the, quote, arrangement language of the statute. The defendants then went on to argue that even if this consent constituted a, quote, agreement under the statute, a treaty must first exist between the nations to authorize the entering into of such arrangements regarding particular vessels. Again, the court here rejects the defendant's argument and notes this argument runs counter to the express language of the treaty, which allows for, quote, treaty or arrangement, end quote. Before concluding its opinion, the court raises the issue of the 
protective principle of jurisdiction and argues that the requirement of consent in the statute was not actually necessary for jurisdiction to be established in this case. The court states, quote, Section 955AC of the Marijuana on the High Seas Act of 1980 requires consent by the foreign nation before enforcement of the United States law. Even absent consent, however, the United States could prosecute foreign nationals on foreign vessels under the protective principle of international law, which permits a nation to assert jurisdiction over a person whose conduct outside the nation's territory threatens the national security or could potentially interfere with the operation of its governmental functions, end quote. According to the court, Congress relied on the protective principle in passing the Marijuana on the High Seas Act because it can sometimes be difficult to establish that a vessel seized on the high seas was heading to the United States as opposed to some other country within its track. Pursuant to the protective principle, therefore, Congress could have left off the requirement of consent from the other nation entirely. According to the court, however, Congress did not do this because it did not want to risk unnecessary friction with foreign nations. Therefore, as a diplomatic matter, rather than as a legal requirement under international law, Congress included the requirement of consent here. Again, an interesting examination of the idea of protective jurisdiction and just how broad that concept may be applied by courts in looking at the reach of the U.S. Congress in creating these types of statutes. In examining the Gonzalez case, you should note just how broad the court indicates the protective principle can extend. According to the, case, the court, this statute would be permissible even without the consent requirement. In the United States v. Robinson, a case from the First Circuit Court of Appeals, the defendant argued, quote, how can this principle justify prohibiting foreigners on foreign ships 500 miles offshore from possessing drugs that, as far as the statute and clear proof here are concerned, might be bound for Canada, South America, or Zanzibar, end quote. First Circuit rejected the argument. The third section of the materials focuses on the passive personality uh, principle. In the case of United States v. Roberts from the Eastern District of Louisiana, the defendant was charged with sexual abuse of a minor and abusive sexual contact with a minor while on board a cruise ship. The defendant was a national of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The victim was a U.S. citizen. The ship where the incident occurred was not an American vessel and was in international waters at the time of the crime. The company that owned the ship was incorporated under the laws of Panama. The ship was registered in Liberia and flew a, a Liberian flag. The company, however, was publicly traded in the United States and had many American stock owners. Further, the crews had many Americans on board and left and returned from U.S. ports. The defendants moved to dismiss the charges because he argued the United States did not have jurisdiction in the matter because A, the ship was not an American vessel, and B, jurisdiction was not permitted under international law in this case. The court rejected the defendant's arguments as to both matters. First, the court noted that the statutes used to charge the defendants applied within the, quote, special maritime and territorial jurisdiction of the United States. Further, the court noted that in 1994, 18 U.S.C. Section 7, Section 8, was added and expressly states, the special maritime jurisdiction of the United States is extended to include, to the extent permitted by international law, any foreign vessel during a voyage having a scheduled departure from or arrival in the United States with respect to an offense committed by or against a national of the United States. This language clearly indicates that the statute was meant to apply to cases such as this, 
where the vessel departed the United States carrying a large number of Americans, and one of those Americans was the victim. The defendant's second argument focused on the requirements in 18 U.S.C. Section 7, Section 8, that this extension of jurisdiction was limited to situations where it was permitted by international law. Recall that in passing Section 7, the Congress specifically said that this would be to the extent permitted by international law. According to the defendant, the application of jurisdiction here was not permitted. The court, however, disagreed. The court said, quote, the principle of passive personality asserts that a state may apply law, particularly criminal law, to an act committed outside its territory by a person not its national, where the victim of the act was its national. The court notes that this recognized principle of jurisdiction under international law was at play in Congress's decision to extend the jurisdiction to vessels departing or arriving in the United States where there are likely to be a number of American citizens on board. A nice example of the use of person a passive personality can be found in Australia. The statute there reads, uh, a person is guilty of the offense of murder if the person engages in conduct outside Australia and the conduct causes the death of another person and the other person is an Australian citizen or a resident of Australia and the first mentioned person intends to cause or is reckless as to causing the death of an Australian citizen or resident of Australia or any other person by the conduct. Absolute liability applies to paragraph 1C regarding the person being an Australian citizen or a resident of Australia. Note here that there is strict liability as to this final provision, meaning the perpetrator does not need to know that the victim was an Australian. Again, a nice statute to give you further sense for the breadth of the idea of passive personality and also the intent of a nation in trying to protect its nationals even when they are overseas and ensure that there is a venue available to prosecute a perpetrator uh, where the victim uh, is a national of that country. The final section of the materials uh, in introducing the five traditional forms of jurisdiction focuses on the universality uh, principle. Uh, in United States uh, v. Uh, Eunice, an opinion from the uh, District of Columbia Circuit, the defendant challenged his conviction on conspiracy, aircraft piracy, and hostage-taking charges stemming from the hijacking of a Jordanian passenger plane in Beirut, Lebanon. On June 11, 1985, Yunus and three others boarded the plane at the Beirut airport and took the passengers and crew hostage. Included on the plane were two Americans. After numerous attempts to take the plane to various locations failed, the hostage takers uh, returned the plane to Beirut, released the passengers held a press conference and then blew up the airplane. They then fled. The U.S. identified Eunice as the leader and planned an operation to uh, arrest him. Consistent with the plan, undercover FBI agents lured Eunice to a yacht in the Mediterranean. Once the vessel was in international waters, Eunice was arrested. Once arrested, he was transferred to the United States, uh, to a United States naval ship, and eventually from there transported to Washington, D.C., where he was arraigned and indicted. Eunice challenged the court's jurisdiction to try him on the charges stemming from the hijacking in Lebanon. According to Eunice, the federal hostage-taking and air piracy statutes used to charge him did not authorize jurisdiction in this particular case. The Hostage-Taking Act read, Whoever, whether inside or outside the United States, uh, seizes or detains and threatens to kill, to injure or to continue to detain another person in order to compel a third person or a government organization to do or to abstain from any act, shall be punished by imprisonment 
by any term of years or for life. It is not an offense under this section, according to the statute, if the conduct required for the offense occurred outside the United States, unless the offender or the person seized or detained is a national of the United States, the offender is found in the United States, or the governmental organization sought to be compelled is the government of the United States. Before turning to the universality principle in the statute, let's take a moment to examine some of the other jurisdictional doctrines present in this statutory language. First, note that the language in the Hostage-Taking Act permits nationality jurisdiction in applying where the offender is a national of the United States. Similarly, the statute uses passive nationality in saying it applies where the person seized or detained is a national of the United States. Finally, note the final clause uses the protective principle in applying where the United States is the one threatened to be compelled by the hijacker's actions. Returning to the focus of our current discussion, note that the final provision of the statute allows jurisdiction, quote, where the offender is found in the United States, end quote. As the court notes, under the universal jurisdiction principle, states may prescribe and prosecute certain offenses recognized by the community of nations as of universal concern. These include offenses such as piracy, the slave trade, attacks on or hijackings of aircraft, genocide, war crimes, and perhaps certain acts of terrorism, even absent any specific connection between the state and the offense. Eunice argues that the statute only authorizes prosecution in such situations where the person is, quote, found in the United States, thus implying the person cannot be brought to the United States as he was here by the FBI. Further, Eunice argues that international law allows the use of universal jurisdiction for piracy, but not aircraft hijacking. The court rejects these arguments. First, the court notes that the statutory history indicates that Congress had no concern about how the suspect came within U.S. territory when passing the statute. Second, the court clarifies that universal jurisdiction is properly applied to charges of air, of air hijacking. According to the court, quote, aircraft hijacking may well be one of the few crimes so clearly condemned under the laws of nations that states may assert universal jurisdiction to bring offenders to justice even when the state has no territorial connection to the hijacking and its citizens are not involved. As you can tell from the unit's case, universal jurisdiction is an extremely powerful tool. What crimes do you think it should be applied to? Take a few minutes to write down a list of crimes you think might be appropriate before continuing with our video lecture. Now that you've thought about how broadly universal jurisdiction should be applied, take a look at the Restatement Third of the Foreign Relations Law of the United States, particularly the section on universal jurisdiction to define and punish certain offenses from your materials. Look at the crimes they list. They are the ones we've just seen from the Eunice case. Piracy, slave trade, attacks on or hijacking of aircraft, genocide, war crimes, and perhaps certain acts of terrorism. Was this different from your list? As we continue through our materials in this course, you might continue to think about the appropriateness of universal jurisdiction and how far we should allow it to be applied. In doing so, remember to think about the potential dangers of too broad an application of such a powerful jurisdictional hook. This brings us to the end of our introduction to the five traditional forms of jurisdiction, territoriality, nationality, protective jurisdiction, passive nationality, and universal jurisdiction. In closing out our discussion, we must remember that international law does impose limitations on the exercise of jurisdiction even where we might be able to squeeze the case 
into one of the jurisdictional molds under international law that we have just examined. The Restatement Third of the Foreign Relations Law of the United States, section on, quote, limitations on jurisdiction to prescribe, end quote, speaks to this issue specifically. Section one of the Restatement reminds us that even where one of the bases of jurisdiction we just examined might apply, the fundamental question of jurisdiction under international law is always one of, quote, reasonableness. The restatement says, quote, even when one of the bases for jurisdiction under section 402 is present, a state may not exercise jurisdiction to prescribe law with respect to a person or activity having connections with another state when the exercise of such jurisdiction is unreasonable, end quote. This means that courts should always return to this principle at the end to ensure jurisdiction is appropriate. As you think back on the cases we examined earlier in this model, module, do you think there are any cases where this reasonableness question would cause you to rethink the court's decision or the outcome in the case? Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you for a later module on international criminal law.